welcome to the history of the early church. Episode 20, Africa Proconsulatus. First off, I want to thank you all for your prayers and patience. I am now, as you can tell, healthy again. I also want to thank listener Tim for catching my mispronunciation of Leon as Leons which from here on I will call by its Roman name, Lud Dunham, and of my mispronunciation of Polycarp's home of Smyrna as Smyrna. Sorry about that. Last episode, we wrapped up the story of the 2nd century church by looking at the formation of the New Testament canon up to about 195 AD. In this episode, we begin the 3rd century period of church history by returning to the province we briefly visited in episode 17, Roman Africa, the birthplace of Latin Christianity. Before we proceed, I think we should bring ourselves up to speed on what has happened at the imperial level, both to orient ourselves to the time period and because events concerning the Roman emperors will interweave with church history, even more so in the 3rd century. When we last discussed the Roman government, we were in the reign of the infamous Commodus, whose only redeeming quality was his perceived benevolence towards the church. His favorite mistress, before she tried to assassinate him, was Marcia, who either was a Christian or sympathized with the Christians. Bishop Victor of Rome was able to secure the release of Christian confessors from the mines of Sardinia via his connections to her. Now, Commodus's tyranny eventually became too much for the Romans, and he was assassinated, ending the Antonine dynasty and quickly sending the empire into civil war. The ultimate victor in this war was the Roman African Lucius Septimius Severus, who became emperor on April 9th, 193 AD, and defeated all his rivals for the throne within four years. Severus would reign until he died on February 4th to 11, and his family would rule the empire, with one brief interruption, until the year 235. If you want more information, the Civil War and the reign of Severus are covered in episodes 97 to 102 in Mike Duncan's The History of Rome. There are, however, a few things to note about Severus before we proceed to our main topic. Unlike Marcus Aurelius, who personally disliked the faithful, and Commodus, who was merely tolerant, Severus is said to have actually been favorably disposed towards certain select Christians. We are not told why, but I think that, in addition to his wife, Julia Domna, being a Syrian Easterner, a certain event early in Severus's reign explains the emperor's friendly disposition. As he was marching on the path to becoming master of the Roman world, Severus had to defeat a rival by the name of Gaius Pascanius Niger for control of the Eastern Empire. While Severus had defeated Niger by 194 AD, the city of Byzantium in Thrace held out and was run by supporters of the now deceased Niger. Severus's legions besieged the city for over two years before it fell in late 195 AD. One of the men defending the city against Severus's forces was Gaius Cecilius Capella. Capella had earlier served as proconsul of Africa under Commodus, where he had persecuted Christians. Specifically, he was remembered for having the martyr Mavilus of Hadrumentum fed alive to wild beasts. As Byzantium fell to the opposing legions, Capella is said to have cried out, Christians rejoice, before he died. Thus, the Christians of Byzantium welcomed Severus' victory, and even though the emperor severely reduced the city after capturing it, it is possible he may have heard how the Christians supported his forces against those of Niger. At some point when he had fallen ill, Severus sought out a Christian named Proculus, who healed him by anointing the emperor. Severus's son and successor Caracalla also knew this man and treated him well. 
Proculus ultimately died in peace in the imperial palace on the Palatine Hill. Other high-ranking Christian men and women served under Severus and were protected by the emperor, even from fanatical pagan mobs. The infant Caracalla, in fact, had a wet nurse slave who was a Christian. Another particularly notable example of a Christian serving the Roman government occurred in the reigns of Commodus and Caracalla. A freedman named Marcus Aurelius Prozenus was in charge of the supply of wine to the Palatine Palace. Afterwards, he became director of the gladiatorial games, then a steward of imperial assets, and eventually became Caracalla's chief chamberlain. Green, 115. Sometime after he served as director of the gladiatorial games, he converted to Christianity. When he died in 217, his body was taken back to Rome and buried in a wonderful sarcophagus, which attests to both his career and, discreetly, his Christian faith. Proculus and Prozenus are both fine examples of how, in the age of the Severan dynasty, Christianity was, to use the words of William Friend, coming out of the shadows and gaining acceptance and prominence in Roman society. All this said, though, the church was still a religio illicita, illegal, foreign and subject to popular hatred. Pogroms by pagans and Jews and local persecution by conservative governors could occur at any time, at any place in the Roman Empire. To become a Christian still meant distancing oneself from classical society. Before we leave Emperor Severus and the macro view of the empire, there is one final event in his wars for supremacy that may have some bearing on our story. To win control of the northwestern empire, Severus had to defeat his former ally Clodius Albinus. The decisive conflict between the two men took place on February 19, 197, in Gaul, at the city of, wait for it, Ludunum. After Albinus was dead and Severus victorious, the city was sacked and burned. Irenaeus was still bishop of the city at this time, and it was perhaps at this point that the great bishop died in the collateral damage of the Roman Civil War. With all that said, let us proceed to our main topic, Christianity in Roman Africa. The capital of Roman Africa was Carthage. The city of Carthage was founded by Phoenician settlers in the 9th century BC. The Phoenicians were a Semitic people related to the biblical Canaanites who inhabited what is today Lebanon. Carthage was originally ruled by its mother city, Tyre, until the settlement matured into a city and governed itself. The name Carthage is Phoenician for New City. At first, the new city was ruled by kings until the 6th century BC, when authority was concentrated into the hands of two shafits, or judges, annually elected magistrates. The Roman consulship took some inspiration from this system. Like their cousins, the biblical Canaanites, the Carthaginians worshipped Baal and practiced by immolation infanticidal human sacrifice. The archaeological evidence of this horrific practice can still be seen today. With the fall of Tyre to the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar II, Carthage became the premier city of the Phoenician colonies. Soon the Carthaginians were in charge of a Mediterranean empire spanning across the coasts of Africa, Numidia, Mauritania, and even the Iberian Peninsula. In addition to this, they also had a foothold on major islands such as Sardinia and Sicily. The latter is where their conflict with the early Roman Republic began. Over the course of the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC, Roman Carthage battled for dominance over the western Mediterranean. Obviously, Rome emerged victorious. Carthage was destroyed in 146 BC. Unreliable legend says the ground was salted, 
so that nothing could ever grow there again. While Carthage the Empire was done, Carthage the city was about to enter a new phase in its long life. It was Augustus Caesar himself who re-established Carthage as a Roman colony in 40 BC. From then on, the city would rise to be second only to Rome as the major city of the West. Augustus set Carthage as the capital of his newly reorganized province of Africa Proconsularis, so named because it was governed by an annually appointed proconsul, who arrived every July. Africa Proconsularis included what is today Tunisia and stretched across the coast of Libya all the way to Cyrenaica, just west of Egypt. This Libyan part of Africa was called by the Romans Tripolitania. The most prominent city of Tripolitania was the home of the aforementioned Emperor Septimius Severus, Leptis Magna. Finally, Roman North Africa, when discussed in scholar literature, also includes the territory of Numidia and Mauritania to the west. These provinces were acquired by the Romans separately from their wars with Carthage. As a Roman city, Carthage retained much of its Phoenician heritage. The forum at the center of the city was located on the dominating Bursa Hill. From this, the Romans applied their characteristic grid structure, complete with key roads, baths, a circus, and theaters. As a major port city, Carthage had two, an inner military port, which was circular in shape, and a long rectangular commercial port to the south, connecting to the military harbor. In Carthage, one could find the native Punic language, occasionally Greek, and of course Latin spoken among the Denzians of the city. The gods of both Rome and Carthage were worshipped and sometimes assimilated to one another. Thus, the main deity of Carthage, Baal Haman, was assimilated to the Roman Saturn, the father of Jupiter. However, it should be noted that the Romans were able to eventually stamp out the practice of human sacrifice once they controlled the area. Carthage was also a center of sophisticated intellectual Latin learning and rhetoric. By the time of Septimius Severus, the bustling trade port city had grown to eclipse even its pre-Roman prosperity. We have very little information on when and how Christianity arrived in Roman Africa. The earliest record of Christians in Roman Africa are the martyrdoms of July 180 AD under the proconsul Publius Vigilius Saturninus that we saw in episode 17. No claims to apostolic origin were ever made by the bishops of Carthage like those in Rome or Alexandria. Sacrifice once they it is thought by some scholars that African Christianity originated Carthage like it also did elsewhere among the local Jewish population. Jews had a strong presence in Carthage. Many of them were descended from Eastern Greek speakers who migrated to the region. This is certainly possible, but cannot be demonstrated for certain. More likely, the early African church originated from a variety of peoples from across the empire, mixing together in the cosmopolitan environment of Carthage. Christianity in Africa was itself a mixed entity. Not only were there Catholics, but heretical groups as well, including the followers of Valentinus, Marcion, and Montanus. Enter Quintus Septimius Florens Tertullianus, better known to us as Tertullian of Carthage, the father of Latin Christianity. Despite his great importance for the history of the early church, very little can be known about Tertullian in terms of biographical details. Up until 1971, the standard account of Tertullian's life followed the account of the late 4th century church father, Jerome. In his book on illustrious men, Jerome compiled small biographies of prominent believers from the Apostle Paul to the holy men of Jerome's own day. Tertullian is the 53rd entry in Jerome's book. According to Jerome, Tertullian was the son of a Roman centurion and a presbyter in the church of Carthage, who lived a long life but at some point left the Catholic Church and became a Montanist. 
Jerome's contemporary, Augustine, stated that Tertullian eventually left the Montanist movement as well and formed his own sect, the Tertullianists. Many historians also thought Tertullian was a professional lawyer before being ordained, perhaps even identifiable with a famous Roman jurist also named Tertullianus. This portrait remained standard until 1971, when scholar Timothy D. Barnes published his monograph, Tertullian, a Historical and Literary Study. In his book, Barnes questions and refutes nearly every element of the standard biography, showing that Jerome and subsequent church writers knew next to nothing historically reliable about Tertullian's life. Eusebius, for instance, in his church history, knew very little of the Latin West. He was aware of Tertullian's existence, but not much else. While initially met with skepticism, Barnes's views have prevailed among scholars specializing in Tertullian. Hence, I will be following his reconstruction in this episode. Thus, following Barnes, Tertullian was not a presbyter, he was not the son of a centurion, and he was not a lawyer, nor the famous jurist Tertullianus, although he was acquainted with Roman law better than most lay people. What we really know about Tertullian comes to us through his writings, of which 31 Latin texts are extant. Regrettably, Tertullian does not afford us much of a narrative. A biography of this brilliant thinker cannot be written in the conventional sense. As a result, this episode will jump around in terms of the timeline. But don't worry, next week we'll be back to our usual chronological approach. Tertullian was born sometime in the mid-2nd century in Roman Africa. He grew up a pagan, but converted to Christianity around 195 AD. He was married, and his wife was a Christian, although when she became a believer is unknown, as is the time of her death. Indeed, very little about their relationship is known. However, Tertullian did admit to adultery in his book On the Resurrection, which seems to imply Tertullian was still a pagan when he was married, as he says that he strove now as a Christian to live a chaste life. He was acquainted with Roman law as well as Latin rhetoric. He was also familiar with Christian Greek authors such as the Apologists and Irenaeus of Lugdunum although he only wrote in Latin. Tertullian's large literary output appears to end shortly after 213 AD or so, suggesting that he did not live too long after that. It is not Tertullian's life, but his thought, which is his legacy. As the first major Christian author to write in Latin, he left the Western Church with a linguistic and intellectual starting point for its theology. Just as Theophilus of Antioch was the first Greek author to use the word trinity, Tertullian was the first Latin author to use the word trinitas. Many of the Latin words he used to express Christian theology became part of the standard lexicon for Christians in the Western Roman Empire. His large literary output also means that Tertullian has left us with his thoughts and opinions on a variety of subjects, from martyrdom to female dress. Like previous authors that we have looked at, a full analysis of all Tertullian's thought will require numerous episodes. Hence what follows is a sample of Tertullian's theology and views. Perhaps Tertullian's most enduring contribution to Orthodox Catholic theology was his theology of the Holy Trinity. Like many early Orthodox thinkers, Tertullian's writing concerning the Trinity was prompted by heresy, specifically the heresy usually known as modalism or monarchianism. Tertullian traced this heresy to a man named Praxius. Praxius was the Asian who convinced Eleutherius of Rome to reject the Montanus prophecy. Who was this Praxius? Praxius is not an actual name, so his real identity is subject to debate. However, this need not concern us at the moment, as we will go into great detail on the Monarchians in an upcoming episode where we examine the Church of Rome in the early 3rd century. For now, we shall briefly look at what the modalist Monarchianism of Praxius was and how Tertullian responded 
by refuting it and defending the Catholic doctrine of the Trinity. Modalism, also known as Monarchianism, was a theological position that originated in Asia. It was an attempt to reconcile the Christian belief in monotheism and the belief that Jesus of Nazareth was the divine word of God the Father. While Justin Martyr and others spoke approvingly of language of two entities in the Godhead, Father and Son, the modalists believe that this to be essentially polytheism. Therefore, the modalists believed that father and son were not distinct in any way, but simply names used to refer to the same God in different times. As a result, they believed that God the Father had suffered and died and rose from the dead, since the father and his son were one identical person. This aspect of their teaching is known as patripassionism, meaning the father underwent the passion at Golgotha. Tertullian wrote against Praxias, and in doing so, provided a thorough defense of the Catholic doctrine of the Holy Trinity, exegeting scripture and building on the groundwork laid by the apologists and Irenaeus. Tertullian affirmed that the Father, while alone in eternity past, was not truly alone in that his word and wisdom, who became incarnate as Jesus Christ, was always with him, just as human beings have their own reason with inside their minds. To say that the Father eternally possessed his word and wisdom, and communed with him, does not destroy monotheism, or make the Father no longer the single source of all things. Tertullian also introduced to the Latin-speaking church the way of articulating the Trinity in terms of persons and substance. The divine substance was what God is, the divine essence. The divine person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all were of the same substance. The Son was distinguished from the Father in person, but was of the same substance because he was eternally begotten of the Father before all ages. The Spirit as well was of the same substance of the Father because he proceeds from him through the Son. Hence, for Tertullian, the Father had always possessed his eternally begotten word and wisdom, and his Holy Spirit had always proceeded from him. In this way, Tertullian was still able to defend the idea of the Father as the single ultimate source of all things. Like the apologist, Tertullian also held to a distinction between the word before creation and the word begotten for the purpose of creation. Before being brought forth, so to speak, for creation, the Son remained within the Father. Tertullian used the analogy of rays of light emanating from the Son, S-U-N. This tendency of subordinating the Son to the Father in this way would later be controversial in the Church. But for the time, it was an acceptable way to express the eternal generation of the person of the Son from the person of the Father. Tertullian vigorously defended the idea of three persons as completely compatible with monotheism. There was one divine essence which was not divided or separated into three parts, but rather the three persons were distinctions or distributions within the single unified Godhead. To suggest that there was one person who simply existed in different modes contradicted the divine revelation of God himself. Well, with all that said, we shall leave Tertullian's doctrine of the Trinity and move on to further subjects. As is evident in his debates with heretics like Praxius, from the get-go, the Christianity of Tertullian was a tough and resilient faith, fierce and rigorous. Johannes Costin describes Tertullian's writings as such in his Patrology. With a profound knowledge of philosophy, law, Greek, and Latin letters, Tertullian combines an exhaustible vigor, burning rhetoric, and biting satire. His attitude is uncompromising. Forever a fighter, he knew no relenting towards his enemies, whether pagans, Jews, heretics, or later on Catholics. All his writings are polemic. Of fiery temperament and burning energy, he develops a fanatical passion for truth. Costin, 247. 
This estimation is aptly demonstrated by looking at Tertullian's view of the polytheist milieu. Tertullian was very much aware that Christians lived in a pagan world. The question was where to draw the line between accommodation and fealty to Christ. Could a Christian attend ceremonies of pagan friends? Could Christians serve in the Roman army? Was it permissible for Christians to attend public festivals and games? All these questions and much more were being debated by the faithful at this time, and Tertullian never one to turn down an opportunity to expound his own views on controversial subjects, took up his pen and wrote several treatises on various issues. Tertullian tended towards rigorism, which intensified over the course of his life. This intensification eventually caused him to join the Montanist sect in Carthage sometime between 206 and 208 AD. Tertullian's slide into Montanism occurred at a time when the new prophecy was still somewhat acceptable to the Catholic Church of Carthage. Unlike the Eastern Churches, the West was far less condemnatory of Montanism. Hence, Tertullian's decision to become an adherent of the Phrygian movement should not be viewed as a radical moment of change in his life. The main difference between the Catholic Tertullian and the Montanist Tertullian, and keep in mind those two things were not entirely incompatible yet, was the intensification of Tertullian's already intense rigorism. In some respects, Tertullian was more in the mainstream of Christian thought. He believed Christians should not attend gladiatorial games or the theater because of their brutality, inhumanity, or just general celebration of immorality and idolatry. Not to mention bloodlust. But in other areas, he was more marginal in his thinking. Earlier in his life, Tertullian wrote highly of Christian marriage. Later, in his book, Addressed to His Wife, he encouraged her not to remarry should he die. If this was too difficult, she should at least marry a Christian. Towards the end of his literary career, Tertullian had nothing good to say about remarriage, and his arguments against it could easily be taken to suggest that he viewed Christian marriage itself as something negative. Tertullian held that Christians could enter public life in the Roman government so long as they avoided any and all possible idolatry, which basically meant Christians could actually not be in the government. Pagan sacrifice and Roman religion touched every aspect of a magistrate's job. On these grounds, along with violence, Tertullian believed that military service was also forbidden to Christians. When the Emperor Severus died and his sons Caracalla and Geta inherited the empire, they bestowed a donative on their troops in a ceremony involving laurel crowns. A donative was basically a, a bonus that troops got from the Emperor upon his ascension. One soldier refused to wear the crown because he was a Christian, and such a thing was idolatry. The man was promptly arrested and imprisoned to await judgment. The imprisoned military confessor was soon eagerly anticipating martyrdom. Many Christians, including other fellow soldiers, felt this man's actions were rash and provoked unnecessary conflict. Tertullian, on the other hand, praised the confessor for his rejection of the pagan world. For Tertullian, no compromise of any kind could be given to Greco-Roman society. Despite his knowledge of Greek philosophy, Tertullian famously asked rhetorically, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? Tertullian's hostility towards Greek thought was motivated not just by his rigorism, though. For him, all heresies had their origin in capitulating Christian tradition to classical philosophy. Returning to the military confessor, to Tertullian, confessors and martyrs were the best Christians. He himself expressed his own desire for martyrdom. The martyrs exemplified the best Christian virtues of rejecting the world and following Christ unconditionally. He famously described the blood of the martyrs as the seed of the church. Martyrdom for Tertullian was the most perfect and righteous way for a Christian to end his or her life. Indeed, it may have been witnessing the martyrs that converted Tertullian in the first place. 
Unlike many Christians of his day, who believed persecution was a tool of the devil used to create apostates, Tertullian saw persecution as coming from God and not something to flee from. Despite Jesus' words permitting his followers to flee, Tertullian explained this away by arguing these statements of the Lord only applied to the apostles and were no longer relevant for Christians of his day. As far as he was concerned, one should never flee martyrdom. Everyone should eagerly desire to meet their glorious end and win the crown as a gift from God. Tertullian's attitude towards persecution and martyrdom would have profound consequences for the African church. No less than three times did persecution occur in Africa in Tertullian's day. First, in 197 AD, which prompted Tertullian to write his earliest apologetic works. In 203 or 204 AD, when the famous martyrdoms of Perpetua and Felicity occurred, and in late 212 and 213, under the proconsul Publius Julius Scapula Tertullus Priscus. Tertullian's brief yet poignant address to Scapula is likely the last thing he wrote. In it, he fearlessly addresses the proconsul, declaring the gods of Rome to be devils and the, that Christians are not afraid to die for their faith. At the same time, he pointed out how proconsuls who persecuted like Vigilius Saturninus and Tucilius Capella, suffered later in life. Saturninus went blind sometime after executing the Scalitian martyrs, and Capella died fighting Severus's legions in Byzantium. He also listed proconsuls who discouraged persecution and refused to prosecute accused Christians. Finally, as a sort of coup de grace, Tertullian pointed out how both the emperors Severus and Caracalla had Christians working for them and treated them well. Tertullian, in his earlier writings, put his great literary and rhetorical skills to defending Christianity against pagans. While drawing on the Greek apologists of the 2nd century, Tertullian intelligently addressed his apologies locally, not to the emperors themselves, recognizing that local government had more of an impact in persecution than the central authorities on the Palatine Hill. This ease with which persecution could come about via popular outrage is illustrated well when Tertullian states in his apology that if the Tiber River rises too much, or the Nile too little, or an earthquake, or famine, or plague strikes the pagans, all chant Christians to the lion. Tertullian, in good rhetorical fashion, humorously asks, what, all them, the Christians, to one lion? Persecution was a legal paradox. Christians committed no real crime. They were not disloyal. In fact, Christians were the emperor's most loyal subjects, as they prayed to the one true God on his behalf, and believed God had given him his authority. Tertullian especially used the example of the Christian soldiers whose prayers saved Marcus Aurelius with the rain miracle in the Marcomannic Wars. Christians only wish to worship their god and not be forced to worship others. Religious freedom was a natural right for all human beings. No one should be compelled to sacrifice to demons. All of this stems from the fundamental issue between Roman pagans and the Christians the Pax Deorum, the peace of the gods. Christians, by their atheism, threaten that peace, and thus the safety of the Roman Empire. Perhaps in this case, Tertullian was justified in believing that there was no middle ground between the church and the empire. In the end, one side would have to concede. Tertullian died in the early 3rd century. His fall into Montanism meant that he was never recognized as a saint by later generations. As a result, no ancient or medieval depiction of him exists. In fact, very few pieces of art depicting Tertullian can be found today. He had a beard and wore the pallium, but he still remains a faceless figure. Done. Six. His legacy was his literary output, affecting both the theology of orthodoxy and the character of North African Christianity. 
next episode, we will look at two Carthaginian women who embodied the uncompromising stand and zeal for martyrdom their contemporary Tertullian held so high, Perpetua and Felicity. Thank you for listening. Be sure to tell anyone you think may be interested to check out the show. If you have thoughts or questions about the podcast, feel free to email me at historyoftheearlychurch at gmail.com. Leave a comment on the website historyoftheearlychurch.wordpress.com or post a comment on the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash early church podcast. And of course, please leave a review on iTunes. iTunes reviews are amongst the best ways you can support the podcast. And for me, help the show. Episode 21, Perpetuous Passion. Last episode, we looked at the career of Tertullian Carthage, the father of Latin Christianity. Today, we take an in-depth look at a series of martyrdoms contemporary with Tertullian, which took place in his home city of Carthage. Now, remember how last time I said that the Roman Emperor Septimius Severus was favorable towards certain Christians in his service? That may cause you to think that the Emperor was fairly tolerant towards the Church. He didn't give the Church legal recognition, but he didn't sanction pogroms like Marcus Aurelius or use them as scapegoats like Nero. As you all know, persecution so far has been, aside from Nero, a locally-based affair. But, as it turns out, there is some evidence that Severus may have been the first Roman emperor to order a general persecution of Christians. Now, in fairness to Severus, this may or may not be true. Modern scholars are divided over whether Severus issued an edict against Christianity. So, in order to evaluate whether or not the emperor ought to be labeled a persecutor, we need to examine our primary sources. The evidence for Severus as a persecutor is derived from later accounts, which at first glance appear to be confirmed by contemporary sources. One is a work called the Historia Augusta, a 4th century collection of Latin biographies of emperors from Hadrian to Diocletian. In the life of Severus, it is claimed that during the emperor's war against Parthia, conflict broke out among the Jews and Samaritans. Later sources state this occurred in 197 and was essentially infighting between the Jews and Samaritans. The Historia Augusta alleges that in response, Severus issued an edict banning conversion to Judaism. It then goes on to vaguely state that he issued a similar anti-conversion edict against Christians. Our old friend, Eusebius of Caesarea, appears to corroborate this report in his church history by stating that Severus instituted a persecution. Eusebius gives as examples martyrdoms that occurred in Alexandria in the early 3rd century, events we shall get to in the next couple of episodes. Finally, there is the magnificent contemporary document called the Passion of Perpetua and Felicity which goes into great detail concerning specific martyrs who died in Carthage in 203 AD. Both the martyrdoms named in Eusebius and the Passion deal with catechumens, corresponding to the statement in the Historia Augusta. By the way, for those of you who do not remember, catechumens are converts who are being instructed and preparing for baptism. 
All of this would seem to confirm that Severus started some sort of persecution against Christianity. But there are problems with this. The Historia Augusta is a notoriously unreliable source, containing far more fa fiction than fact. Eusebius tended to merge periods of persecution and martyrdom into the reigns of certain emperors, in keeping with his incorrect view that persecution had always been an imperial top-down initiative. For instance, he places the martyrdom of Polycarp under Marcus Aurelius rather than when it actually occurred under Antoninus Pius. It is from reading Eusebius that we today get the historically incorrect notion that there were ten persecutions of Christians in the Roman Empire. Also, not all of the martyrs reported at this time were catechumens, contradicting what the Historia Augusta appears to be saying. Eusebius also conflates different pogroms in Alexandria that were at least three years apart. Also, the only martyrs Eusebius discusses are from Alexandria. No account is given from other areas across the empire. The actual contemporary sources do not mention Severus initiating a persecution. Tertullian says nothing of this sort, and the Passion of Perpetua and Felicity don't say anything of that sort either. Finally, the dates of the martyrs in Eusebius and the Passion occur about three to five whole years after Severus is said to have issued his edict, rather than right away. So where does this leave us? Was Septimius Severus a persecutor, the first imperial persecutor since Nero, and the first emperor to initiate an empire-wide persecution? I honestly don't know. Equally competent scholars that I've been reading look at the exact same evidence and come to different conclusions. If I were a betting man, I would lean in the direction that says Severus was not a persecutor. Had he done so, I think Tertullian would surely have addressed an apology to the emperor. But, then again, Severus, while kind to Christians he personally knew, did nothing to legalize the church, and the Severan Age was a high watermark of Roman and syncretic paganism, centered around the ever-so-popular cult of the emperor. If Severus believed Christians were disloyal, it would not be out of character for him to persecute them. In the end, though, it doesn't really matter. The legal status of Christians remained the same. Condemned for the name by unwritten law as a religio illicita, threatening the peace of the gods and thus national security. Just as we had earlier authentic records of martyrs like the martyrdom of Polycarp, the acts of Justin and his companions, and the acts of the Scalitian martyrs, an authentic and exceptional martyrdom account, the aforementioned Passion of Perpetua and Felicity, survives to us today. The document is exceptional in that part of it was written by two martyrs themselves, Perpetua and Saturus. An unknown Christian redactor, probably an affiliate of Tertullian, wrote an introduction and epilogue to these two accounts. The Passion gives us a first-hand look at what early Christian martyrs were thinking and feeling as they prepared to die. The exact circumstances of what brought about the arrests of various Carthaginian Christians is unknown. Popular enmity, a local disaster, or Severus's supposed anti-conversion edict. We simply don't know. But we do know that the magistrate in charge of the persecution was able and willing to go after the faithful. At the time, the proconsul of Africa had died and his successor had not yet arrived in Carthage. Therefore, the governorship of Africa fell to the procurator, Publius Aelius Hilarionis. Hilarionis was, like many of the persecuting officials we have encountered, a religiously conservative Roman. He and his family were staunchly loyal to the traditional gods of Rome, and objected to trends that pointed away from them. It is no surprise, therefore, that he thought it right and good to persecute the Christians, who impiously denied the divine patrons of Rome. Among those arrested were five young catechumens, Saturninus, Secundulus, two slaves named Revocatus and Felicity, 
and a 22-year-old, well-married, well-educated noblewoman who had just recently given birth to a baby boy, Vibia Perpetua. As she was kept under house arrest, Perpetua's father came to her and tried to persuade her to abandon her faith. But Perpetua unflinchingly affirmed she was a Christian. Just uttering the nomen of Christian was sufficient to stir her father's anger. Perpetua says he came at her as if he was going to tear out her eyes. But instead, he stopped and left, leaving his daughter comforted by his absence, for which she thanked God. In ancient Rome, the father of the family was the pater familias, the autocrat of the household, with absolute authority over his wife and children. Perpetua's Christian defiance was not just a rebellion against the Roman state, but her father as well. Thus, she chose to obey her heavenly father rather than her earthly one. A few days later, Perpetua and the other catechumens were finally baptized into the church, becoming full members of the body of Christ. There was no turning back now. It was at her baptism that Perpetua had her first in a series of prophecies she received from the Holy Spirit. Well, I say first in that it is the first prophecy she records in the extant account, although it is likely she had received visions from the Spirit before, given the matter-of-fact way she described it. Charismatic gifts were not unheard of in the late 2nd and early 3rd century, especially in Africa where Montanism had not yet been firmly rejected. Perpetua's first prophecy was simple instruction from the Spirit. Do not ask for anything after baptism, except for perseverance in the flesh. Some days after their baptism, the five confessors were moved to a crude and dark prison. Perpetua relates how terrified she was. Not only was it pitch black, but the crowd made the heat unbearable. There was also the threatening presence of the soldiers, the malnourishment of the prisoners, but worst of all for Perpetua, she was gripped and tortured with anxiety for her infant son, whom she held at her breast. Then, Two deacons came, named Tertius and Pomponius, who bribed the soldiers to allow the confessors to briefly retire to a more healthy part of the prison. As they left the dungeon and entered this better part of the prison, Perpetua saw that her baby was faint from hunger. She immediately began to nurse him. Then she was allowed to speak with her mother concerning her child. With Perpetua's mother was also her brother, who was himself a catechumen, though he had somehow managed to escape arrest. Perpetua decided to commit her infant son to the care of her mother and brother, but this did little to assuage the anguish she felt for him. A few days later, the child was brought back to her, and at once Perpetua was revived in her health. Her worry dissipated as she was able to hold her son in her arms again. Eventually, though, she would have to make a hard choice. Perpetua could not remain with her son to care for him in this world, and also keep her Christian faith. She would be asked soon to renounce her religion by Hilarionis. If she refused, she would die. I cannot imagine the emotional conflict she felt. On the one hand, she loved the Lord God with all her heart, and would never dream of denying him. But on the other hand, the bonds of maternal love between her and her child were like any mother, overwhelmingly strong. When Jesus said one has to deny everything to follow him, he really meant what he said. When Perpetua's child was returned to her, she was prompted to ask God for a prophecy on whether or not she and the others would indeed suffer martyrdom. Sure enough, Perpetua was granted a vision. She saw in her dream a large bronze ladder, on either side of it were all manner of dangerous weapons ready to ensnare the unwary climber. At the foot of the ladder was an enormous dragon. From up top, Perpetua's fellow Christian, Saturus, called to her. Saturus was probably the man who catechized Perpetua. He was also imprisoned at a later time with the other five confessors. 
Satoris told Perpetua he was waiting for her at the top of the ladder, but cautioned her to not let the dragon bite her. But Perpetua boldly proclaimed that, in the name of Christ Jesus, the dragon would not harm her. This scared the dragon, and Perpetua took her first step on his head to climb up the ladder. Upon reaching the top, she entered the Garden of Paradise, where thousands of people were clothed in white garments. They surrounded a gray-haired man, who was a shepherd, who offered Perpetua sweet milk to drink. When she did, the entire assembly shouted Amen, at which Perpetua woke up and related her dream to a fellow confessor. She understood the message of the dream. She was going to die. Her days were numbered. As the day of their hearing approached, Perpetua was once again visited by her father. This time he was not mad, but wept bitterly at her feet, addressing her not as daughter, but as lady. He desperately tried to convince Perpetua to abandon her present course. Perpetua felt sorry for her father and tried to comfort him, but to no avail. He departed from her again, this time in tears. Finally, the day came for the confessor's hearing. They were assembled on the prisoner's dock in the public forum of Carthage. A large crowd gathered to watch the proceedings. All the confessors who went before Perpetua confessed Christianity. When it was Perpetua's turn before the procurator, her father appeared again, this time with her infant son. He desperately tried once again to persuade his daughter to offer pagan sacrifice and have pity on her newborn son. Hilarionis echoed these sentiments and exhorted Perpetua to sacrifice on behalf of the emperors and to have mercy upon her old father. Perpetua refused. Finally, it was time for Hilarionis to ask the question, Are you a Christian? Yes, Perpetua answered. And with that, her fate was sealed. But her father persisted, and when he continued trying to dissuade Perpetua, Hilarionis had him thrown down and beaten. Then the procurator announced that the confessors would all be condemned to die in the amphitheater of Carthage by wild beasts. The confessors were then returned to the prison. It was at this stage, when the sentence of death had been proclaimed, that Perpetua relinquished her role as mother. Being concerned for her infant, she sent the deacon Pomponius to get her child from her father, but her father refused. Now the boy had become accustomed to his mother nursing him in prison, but then God alleviated Perpetua's anxiety for her baby. The child no longer desired to be nursed, and Perpetua did not feel any discomfort in her breasts. Her worry over her boy ceased. She could now turn her attention solely to claiming the crown of martyrdom. As she was praying in prison, Perpetua uttered the name Dinocrates. Dinocrates was another biological brother of hers who died when he was only seven, most likely not a Christian. Perpetua began to pray day and night for her dead brother's spirit until she and the other confessors were transported to the military prison. She then had a vision of her brother suffering in a dark place, probably Hades. But as she sat in chains in the military prison, she had another dream showing how God had answered her prayers and delivered Democrates from suffering in the afterlife. So close was Perpetua to the Lord that so powerful were her prayers. When the confessors had been transferred to the military prison, it was announced they would die in the arena in celebration of the birthday of the emperor's younger son, Caesar Geta. The day was thus to be March 7th, 203 AD. As the day approached, the officer in charge of the prison developed a friendly disposition towards the confessors and allowed guests to visit them. One of these visitors was Perpetua's father, who visited his recalcitrant daughter one final time. Of course, he failed to change her mind. He tore at his beard and uttered profanities. She self felt sorry for him, but her path was chosen. Before they were to be brought into the arena, Perpetua had another vision. 
In her dream, the deacon Pomponius led her to the amphitheater, where a great and terrible Egyptian warrior appeared before her, aided by his assistants. Perpetua was then stripped of her clothes, and then suddenly, and most perplexingly, physically transformed into a man. Perpetua's own assistant stood by her and rubbed her with oils to prepare her new male form for the fight. And fight she did, and victorious she was. Awaking from this dream, Perpetua was convinced God would grant her victory over his enemies on the following day. This is where her own account in the Passion of Perpetua and Felicity ends. Perpetua's instructor, Saturus, also received a vision from God on the eve of their execution. In his dream, he and Perpetua were carried to paradise by four angels. There, they met other local martyrs who had all been recently burned alive or killed in prison. Then they were taken by four other angels to meet the Lord. Saturus and Perpetua saw the enthroned, gray-haired man with a youthful face, surrounded by elders clothed in white. The confessors were raised up so that they kissed the aged man, and he in turn touched their faces with his hands. Then they exchanged the kiss of peace with the elders, and Perpetua thanked God for the happiness of paradise. Next, Saturus and Perpetua were directed to the bishop, Optatus, and the presbyter, Aspasius, both apparently still alive on earth, but torn from one another by a feud. Both the bishop and the presbyter fell at the two confessors' feet, much to Saturus and Perpetua's surprise, asking them to make peace between the two of them. As the two confessors consoled Optatus and Aspasius, angels came and told the two clergymen to settle the conflict between themselves and let the martyrs enjoy paradise. They also admonished Optatus to take control of his irreverent flock. After the two clergymen left, Saturus saw many of his brothers and sisters who had been martyred and reaped the joys of heaven. After this, he woke up, and here his account ends, and the narrator picks up. I should point out that Optatus is the earliest bishop of Carthage that we know of. He will certainly not be the last. Turning to the other confessors in prison, Secondulus was killed by the sword while still in prison. One of the slave confessors, the young woman Felicity, was eight months pregnant when she was arrested, and she feared she would not get to attain the crown of martyrdom with her brethren, given that Roman law did not allow for women with child to be executed. But her brethren prayed for Felicity, and just two days after their ordeal, I'm sorry, before their ordeal was to take place, she gave birth to a baby girl, who was then entrusted to the care of another local Christian woman. Like Perpetua, Felicity had to give up her child to follow Jesus. On March 7, 203 AD, all five confessors, Perpetua, Saturus, Saturninus, Revocatus, and Felicity, marched triumphantly into the arena. The authorities tried to force them to wear pagan clothing, but they resisted, and the officers dropped the matter. The Christians would die just as they were. The three male confessors addressed Hilarionis and the crowd, declaring that, while they had condemned the Christian martyrs, God would condemn them. And so it began. Saturninus and Revocatus were attacked first by a leopard, and then put into stocks, and attacked by a bear. Saturus was set against a wild boar, but instead the gladiator who tied the animal to the martyr was fatally attacked by the boar while it dragged Saturus along. So Saturus was also put into the stocks to die by the bear, but much to his relief, the animal would not attack him. Perpetua and Felicity were stripped naked placed into nets, and offered to a wild heifer. This actually shocked the crowd, seeing two naked young women, one delicate and the other fresh from childbirth. So they were given simple tunics to cover their bodies. Then the heifer tossed Perpetua on her back. As she got up, she remembered her modesty and pulled her tunic down. Felicity had been crushed by the heifer, and Perpetua helped her to her feet. The two Christian women stood together against the heathen crowd. 
the bloodlust of the audience now satisfied, the two believers were led back behind the gate. There, Perpetua encountered her Christian brother Rusticus, a catechumen. He had come with other believers awaiting baptism. Perpetua encouraged them to remain strong in the faith and not lose hope in light of her and the others' impending death. At another gate, Saturus was talking with the soldier who had been kind to them earlier and allowed them to see guests. Saturus reminded the soldier of a conversation they had had earlier when Saturus had predicted that at first no animal would touch him and the second time the single bite of a leopard would do him in. Sure enough, it was so. Saturus was brought back out, and a leopard bit him once, and immediately he was drenched in a second baptism of his own blood. He then asked the friendly soldier for his ring. The soldier obliged, and Saturus dipped it in his own blood, handing it back to the soldier as a testament to his own martyrdom. After that, Saturus was put out of his misery by the gladiator's sword, and his body displayed before the crowd. The time came to put the other four martyrs to death. The gladiators were called forth and plunged their swords into the martyrs' throats. The young man tasked to kill Perpetua stabbed her first, and she let out a scream, but he trembled to finish her off. And so Perpetua guided his hand to her throat, and he plunged the blade through her neck. Thus, on March 7, 203 AD, in the amphitheater of Carthage, the young Christians Vibia Perpetua, Saturus, Saturninus, Revocatus, and Felicity were died, martyred under the procurator Publius Aelius Hilarionis. The writings of Perpetua and Saturus were edited together into a single text using other eyewitness testimony. The unknown author was probably an affiliate of Tertullian himself. The memory of these martyrs was preserved in the African church. The feast of Perpetua and Felicity would persist as a major holy day in Christian North Africa. The remains of the five martyrs were buried in what was later called the Basilica Maiorum, just south of Carthage, where the faithful continuously venerated their relics in honor of what Christ Jesus had done in them. next episode, we will leave Carthage to visit the other major urban center of Christianity on the African continent, Alexandria, capital of Roman Egypt, and center of ancient learning. Thank you for listening. If you have questions or feedback about the podcast, you can email me at historyoftheearlychurch at gmail.com. Please don't forget to leave a review on iTunes. Post a comment on the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash early church podcast. And don't forget to visit the website at historyofthearlychurch.wordpress.com.